Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, July 1st, 2014. It's 6.30 p.m. We're at the Palm Coast Community Center for the regularly scheduled meeting of the Palm Coast City Council. Before the Pledge of Allegiance, let me just announce the score is 2 to 1, unfortunately, with Belgium in the lead. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Mayor Nitz. Here. Vice Mayor DiLorenzo. Here. Council Member Ferguson. Here. Council Member Lewis. Here. Council Member McGuire. Here. Mayor, all members are present. Thank you very much. First item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of the June 17th Council meeting and the June 24th Council workshops. Are there any additions, corrections, or is there a motion for approval? Move to approve. Second. Moved and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries without objection. Agenda item number two, proclamation recognizing July 1st, 2014 as Senator Thrasher and Representative Hudson Appreciation Day in Palm Coast. Mr. Landon, would you like to introduce this? Uh, sure, I would love to introduce this. Uh, our, our, stu our, our two state representatives here uh, really helped us a great deal this year. We had a, a couple of projects, a couple of high, high priorities, city council, and one of them uh, actually happened more last summer, but uh, uh, the Old Kings Road extension and advancing that funding so that it happened at the same time the Palm, uh, Matanzas Wood interchange occurred so that uh, we'd have local traffic get to that interchange without going by the high school. So that's good for all of us. And of course, this uh, during session, uh, the state was funding some water projects, water improvement projects, finally. Uh, it shows that times have improved. And, uh, we were able to get one of our water projects that will uh, deal with some of the, the color and, and iron in our uh, water system so we can meet the Clean Water Act. And uh, both Mr. Hutchins and, and Thrasher were very uh, helpful in, in making that happen. And then, then, you know, during the year we also had good luck with things like uh, uh, the rental home, vacation rental homes that they helped with, uh, the TPO, a lot of that was going on behind the scenes and, and working through the TPO. So, you know, it was a good year for us at the state. We, we complain about Tallahassee on a regular basis. It's actually kind of nice to say thank you and we appreciate it once in a while, so. Council member. Come on. The honor this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Proclamation. Whereas Florida Senator John Thrasher and Florida Representative Travis Hudson represent legislative districts that include the city of Palm Coast. And whereas during the 2014 Florida legislative session, Florida Senator Thrasher and Florida Representative Hudson were instrumental in securing funding for the Palm Coast Water Treatment Plant Number 3, Concentrate Treatment Project for Iron and Color Reduction. And whereas this project will re uh, recover and treat 750,000 gallons on an average annual day, water that previously would have been discarded and will result in, uh, and would have resulted in few, and will result in fewer required wells in the future, reducing the burden on the water supply and on Palm Coast utility ratepayers. And whereas this project will allow water treatment plant number three to operate at 100 plus percent recovery, 100 plus is pretty encouraging, <laughs> making it environmentally friendly and one of the most efficient nano filtration plants in the world. And whereas Senator Thrasher and Representative Hudson assisted with other legislative priorities during the 2014 Florida legislation, legislative session on behalf of the citizens of Palm Coast and the state of Florida. And whereas these legislative priorities, including acceleration of transportation priorities in the Palm Coast Northeast Corridor and increasing local control over vacation rental regulations. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Palm Coast does hereby designate July 1, 2014, as Senator Thrasher and Representative Hudson Appreciation Day in Palm Coast. Signed this first day of July, 2014, City of Palm Coast, Florida, John Nets Mayor. Maybe Mayor and all council, if 
Come yeah. on, council members. Be a good. One Do I turn it off? Is it on now? Thank you guys. This is um, a, a big honor. I, I really appreciate this. You know, I, I believe it was as mentioned by Mr. Ferguson that Senator Thrasher and I were instrumental as he read it of getting this done. I think the senator was the instrument and I was the old part. Um, <laughs> but no, this is a big thing. I'm, I'm happy as you know, uh, my first year up there and, and with the senator's great help to be able to do something for our district and bring something back home. And this is a, this is a big award and I, I appreciate this and it's gonna be hung in the office and, and just thank you for all you guys doing. I'm, I'm looking forward to serving for two more years and, and helping out in any way I can. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mayor and members. I, uh, I know this, Travis, we both appreciate it. It's like you said, Mayor, it's nice to receive something uh, of nice every now and then. I used to be on the school board years and years ago uh, when I, I first elected job, and I used to uh, complain and moan about what Tallahassee was doing to us at that time, and I understand. Uh, there are a lot of things go on there that, that particularly we don't like, but uh, sometimes that, that happens. But it's good to, to do this. Uh, it's, Travis and I both have enjoyed <coughs> representing Flagler County. I, I know five years ago when I was elected, I was kind of a new person here, and I and I hope I've gotten to know as many of you as I can. And we look forward to working for you and doing other things for you as as the uh, next session uh, comes about. The economy is improving. That's the good news. And so, if there are some additional things out there that we can help with as this session starts to approach, I hope you'll let us know. But we dearly appreciate this. It's an honor to be here. Thank you all for this great recognition. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shannon. You know, I, Council, we know how busy we are taking care of the business of one little city. The representative and the senator have a whole district to care for and tremendous amount of time and effort has to go into their job. And yet every time we've gone to Tallahassee, every time we've made a phone call, they've made time for us and they've listened. And in most cases, they've been extraordinarily supportive. So thank you on behalf of the city of Palm Coast. Thank you. Agenda item number three, proclamation recognizing the month of July as Parks and Recreation Month. Mr. Landon. It's fun time again, summertime, and uh, uh, this is an annual event, and Luann and her staff, uh, I think, really look forward to this. They're going to do a little presentation and a little video that, um, uh, are we going to do the proclamation first? Mr. McGuire, please. <laughs> Whereas parks and recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of Palm Coast, and whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens, and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of a community and region, and whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, pro provide therapeutic recreation services services for those who are mentally or physically disabled and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens and whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses and crime reduction and whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. 
And whereas parks and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed, the City Council of the City of Palm Coast does hereby proclaim the month of July as Parks and Recreation Month and encourage residents and visitors to enjoy using the parks, trails, programs, and special places that enhance the quality of life in our community. Signed this first day of July, 2014, City of Palm Coast, Florida, John Nets, Mayor. And now to speak for Parks and Recreation, our very own Luciano <laughs> Pavarotti, no. <laughs> uh, thank you all, Mayor City Council. I first want to thank you uh, for recognizing July as Parks and Recreation Month here in Palm Coast and across our country. Um, as I have said in the past, the support from all of you um, sitting at the dais this evening and our co-workers in all the departments and divisions has been the best experience that I've had in my 20-year career and I couldn't be more thankful for the support that we get across the board um, regardless of who we call or who we talk to within the city um, they are always there willing and able to help us so thank you to everybody um, I want to introduce our parks and recreation staff and we have some new members with us uh, tonight um, well first we'll start with Lauren Bennett who is our recreation supervisor for general recreation and she's the one that puts together all our camps and programs um, for adults, seniors, kids, um, everybody, you name it, she does it. Um, James Hurst is our new aquatic supervisor. Um, you will see him at Frida Zamba Swimming Pool. Um, and uh, doing our programs, lifeguard training, uh, swim lessons, diving movies, you name it, at the pool, he'll be there and a part of it. Uh, Sandy Miller is one of our leisure service advisory committee members and is here with us tonight and always supportive and, and there and volunteering whenever we need her. And Roxy Gonzalez, our newest member, um, or one of our newest members, our recreation superintendent who um, helps me get everything done that we do here in our department. So, um, your recreation staff. So, thank you. Um, I continually get asked, uh, what do you do in parks and recreation? And my mom asks me all the time, and I try to explain to her what I do, and it's really hard. Um, so, I tell her, you know, go to the Y, and that's kind of what we do, and go over here, and that's kind of what we do. Um, and I never have a really good, concise um, explanation to share with anybody who asks me that question. Um, and as we were getting ready for tonight, it's been over a year, um, and I went to our communications and marketing division and said okay here's my thought I want to really show what it would be like a day in the life of parks and recreation to try to encapsulate all that we do in about two minutes um, and what they produced and what they came up with is better than what I could have envisioned and so without any further ado a walk through life hey you know what Parks and Recreation sure has a lot of things going on all the time. They sure do. They really have something for everyone. Even my family, friends, and neighbors participate. Wouldn't it be great if Parks and Rec had a video showing all they do? That's what I said. <laughs> you know what? I think they do.
And the first time I saw it, I actually cried. <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to thank um, our communications and marketing team, Cindy, Jason, and Tom, who put that together. Only one word can explain it, and that's awesome. So thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you. And what this video did for me is, you know, we get so caught up in the planning of all these events and activities that we really don't get the time to see people enjoying the event. And this video really helped all of us really see the smiles on the faces and, and how much people here appreciate what we provide for them. Um, and so it was, it was good for us to see that and, and good to know that um, we're on the right track and, and that we're doing good here in our community. And, and again, it's Thanks to your support and the support of everybody here in the city, all the departments, all the divisions. I was writing out the list today of who helps us when we do events, and I don't think there's one division in this city or department that hasn't been a part of some event that we've done, including utility. So, um, you know, they, they keep things flowing, good and bad, so, um, and we're very appreciative of that. So, so everybody's involved in what we do, and I can't thank you all enough, and thank you again for the recognition. Oh, and one last thing. Lauren, um, in front of you tonight, there is some information and materials. Um, our new uh, Palm Coast facility guide, again, produced by our communications and marketing uh, division. Uh, we're handing those out, and uh, they're available and really show and highlight the parks here in our community and a great companion piece to our Trek It Out map. Uh, we also have a couple flyers with some of our upcoming events. Um, the, the fire fireworks event this July 3rd, our food truck event, and then Lauren's going to go through the list of all the activities that we have coming up for our Celebrate Parks and Rec Month. Good evening. Um, I hope you're as excited as I am about the stuff that we have upcoming for Parks and Rec Month. Um, we've really tried to incorporate every age group this month. Um, Kickstarting it off is tomorrow with our itsy bitsy pool parties for toddlers. Um, then Thursday is fireworks in the park at Central Park. Uh, the launch site has changed back to the original site it was. So if you caught the fireworks last year, it's in the same spot as it was last year. Um, and then we have our Independence Day celebration ceremony at Heroes Park. Then back to the pool for Red, White, and Blue Day. Um, we really try and pack the pool in and let people know that we do have a great facility. Um, we're offering a Wellness with Christy stability ball class. She's an excellent instructor. She's here year round. Um, and this particular class is free, so you can come and see what she's all about. Um, one of my favorites is our ice cream social at Ralph Carter Park, and that's sponsored by Brewster's. Um, July 11th is Movies in Central Park, and the movie is The Nut Job. Um, another one back at the pool is our Splash and Dash, and the kids will swim really fast in the pool and then run around the Beltaire Park to... Um, compete against their friends and just really celebrate active and healthy lifestyle. Um, and then July 12th also we have our Palm Coast Tennis Center Community Day, which is free. Then back to the pool for pool game day. Um, then Food Truck Tuesday, which is on the front side of the flyer. We are theming it this month. It's Hawaiian and tropical and beachy. The trucks are going to offer different specials that flow with that theme. So come out and wear your grass skirt and do some hula dancing with our DJ. Um, <laughs> Another one we have that week is July 18th is Parents' Night Out. So if you've got your little youngsters and you've been dying to take your wife out or, you know, get rid of the kids in the house because they're going crazy, come, you know, drop them off at the community center. It is pre-registration required. Um, we'll have pizza and movies and play games. Then we have um, a teen water night, which is new this year. So the teens can experience the pool, have some cool chill time and then July 19th is Saturday is our tour to Palm Coast we will start at Linear Park and we will ride six miles make a stop for the flight of life dedication at Waterfront Park um, that was beautiful last year so if you missed it um, definitely come out and do the ride with us we will um, have 
refre refreshments available. Um, for those who ride in the ride, then July 19th is Community Day at Palm Harbor Golf Course, and Nine Holds Special is $20. July 20th, we're going back to the pool for our summer splash. There'll be a DJ there, um, hopefully a food vendor. And then to conclude, celebrating Parks and Rec Month is our dive-in movie, and the movie is The Pirates... No, planes? No. Oh. Planes. Planes. Come out and see planes. Um, <laughs> we are pre selling tickets for the dive in movie. We actually had a, the longest line I have ever seen this past Friday. We allowed 400 people into the facility and we had to turn people away. So this time we're going to pre sell tickets. So if you know anybody that wants to come, um, tickets will go on sale July 11th. So I hope that you will come out and celebrate Parks and Rec Month. Um, definitely come out to the ice cream social because it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Thank you. And all that information, we have it back on the table and there's flyers out front for all the dates and details for all those events. And thank you all again. Thank you. Mayor, if I could, I, I, you know, it just makes me very proud uh, of the advancements that we've seen in our parks and recreation, all those activities, et cetera, and that Luann and her staff has had a great deal to do with that. Uh, and then, of course, our video. I, I see another word's probably coming, but uh, the, the fact that we do this all in-house, most people couldn't imagine the fact that, you know, our city staff puts this together, and it's that cooperative effort between the different departments and divisions. And then the um, um, guide that they put together is just phenomenal. So it makes me very proud. It's really quality work and, and uh, quality programs out there that Parks and Rec puts together. So I had to, had to pat him on the back. Thank you. Agenda item number four, presentation of property tax and millage rate history, part of our ongoing budget preparation process. Mayor, City Council, exactly that. We, we go through uh, the different steps um, to try to help educate and, and keep people informed about our budget process and expenditures. This one, I think, is particularly important because so much of focus is on only about 11% of our revenue, which is property tax, but it's lots of times misunderstood. So hopefully um, people find this very informative. So Chris, take it from here. Chris, when are you going to get a video with jazzy music? Well, you know, Bo asked me in the back if I get up and dance or sing or anything during this presentation, <laughs> and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have anything like that. And uh, if you, you know, did, you could run for mayor of Toronto. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I look like him a little bit. But, um, He's going to lighten up that hair a little bit. You're yeah, close. I, I think so. But but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, nothing like bringing down a room after something like that. Uh, so our property tax presentation, uh, this is another in a series of all of our uh, budget uh, reports and presentations that are presented to City Council as part of our almost at this point year-long budget process. Uh, we're currently in June. Uh, our last presentation was on revenue sources and this one is the property tax presentation. We'll follow up in July with uh, actually going through individual budgets, uh, finalizing those in August and then the public hearings for the budget are in September. So some property tax terminology, a, a lot of it is confusing to folks. Uh, truth in millage or trim essentially is a, sh a shorthand for the rules and regulations uh, promulgated by the state that we have to follow to levy property taxes. Uh, just value, you'll see that uh, if you looked at a property appraiser website, and that's, that's basically an approximation of the market value as determined by the property appraiser of any kind of property. Uh, then you have assessed value, exempt value, and taxable value, and we'll look at those uh, a little closer here. So what actually determines property taxes? Well, th the first step is the property appraiser assesses the value of your homes, taking into account um, certain things like our Save Our Homes limitation, the portability Save Our Homes, you have the 10% limit on non-homesteaded property. Um, these items are, are subtracted from the just value of your home to come to the assessed value of your home or vacant property. 
The taxable value then takes this assessed value and subtracts uh, various exemptions that you may be uh, entitled to. Some of those more popular ones are the homestead exemption. There's also senior, widow, widower exemptions, military exemptions, a number that folks may qualify for. Subtracting that from the assessed value gets you your actual taxable value. The taxable value are really the numbers that uh, City Council has to work with in terms of determining uh, the amount of property taxes that are needed to run a city, a county, or any other uh, taxing entity. Um, the taxable value times the millage rate actually equals the, the property taxes collected. Each taxing authority sets their own millage rates. Uh, we have a number of them in, in uh, Flagler County, which we'll take a look at in a moment. The Save Our Homes limitations, we kind of keep track of this, it, 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 and, and this graph really isn't a surprise with the market value of homes plummeting uh, the last several years. Uh, the amount of Save Our Homes limitations has decreased significantly. It's kind of starting to level off now, um, and we're looking forward to seeing what uh, the next year numbers are. Mm -hmm. So your property tax bill, this is, this is a property tax bill that a, a resident in Palm Coast with a, with a home would receive. Um, you'll see all the different taxing authorities on the bill, Flagler County, the school board, um, the St. John's River Water Management District, the Florida Inland Navigation District, the Mosquito Control District, and the very last line is the city of Palm Coast. Um, each one of those uh, districts and governments uh, set their own millage rates. The only one that we actually have control of is the very bottom one, the city of Palm Coast portion. That's the portion that the city receives property tax revenue for, and that's the only portion of your tax bill city council has any control over, and it represents just over 20% of the tax bill. Here in Palm Coast, uh, it's been fairly consistent, but, but about 82 to 83% of all property taxes are paid by residential property. This hypothetical example um, really is used uh, to, to show the effect uh, on homesteaded properties of the homestead limitations. Basically in the first year, um, to kind of keep it simple, the market value and, and the taxable value of the property is the same. Over time, in this example, we've assumed that the market value of the property increases by 50% every year. Those are the blue bars. But based on the current property tax system we're, we're working under, the taxable value is capped at 3% per year or the CPI, whichever is lower. So over time, as the market value of a home skyrockets, the taxable value of a home barely increases. That's one of the kind of misconceptions, I think, when a lot of folks talk about property taxes. Well, the values are going up, the values are going up. Well, the values may go up, but the actual amount that we're allowed to levy taxes on doesn't increase that much year over year for existing homes. This is the city's uh, millage rate history. Um, 2008, which is right in the middle, was our peak year. Uh, property values uh, just getting over seven billion. Um, we brought in about 20 million in property tax receipts in 2008. In 2014, um, our property values were just under 3.7 billion, which is almost half of what it was in 2008. And during that time, between 2008 and 2014, we've actually decreased the amount of property taxes collected by 5 million. Chris? Yes. <clears throat> Quick question. That you show the peak of seven bill billion. Yes. Is that billion? What, do you have a figure for what the total county was at that peak, or roughly? I don't. Or what I, percent? I do, what I percent of Palm Coast of is of the county in roughly property value? I, I, can I, I would be uh, guessing. Uh, you know, we could talk on average, but I would be guessing back in 2008 what those numbers were at, that, at this point. I, I can help a little bit. It's between 60 and 65 percent right, right now, so it, it probably was about the same at that point too. Okay. Right. Thank you. The county is 65 percent, or the city is. C city is 60, okay. 65 percent. This graph actually uh, talks about the, the millage rate. Um, the bars in green are representative of the rollback rate, which is the rate that could be charged each year to bring in the exact same amount of taxes as you did the previous year. The bars in black are actually what the city council levied as a, as a tax rate, as a millage rate. 
And uh, each year from 2008 to 2014, we have either been at or below the actual rollback rate. And again, this is just a graphical display of the actual tax collections. Again, in 2008, we were just over 20 million. And for the past four years, we've been right around 15 million. 25% decrease. 25% decrease. Last two years. This survey we do each year to kind of see where we fit um, in, in, our, uh, in this size city between 60 and 90,000 a population. There's 18 cities uh, in the state that fit within that area. Uh, city of Palm Coast has the third lowest millage rate. Um, one of the things to kind of point out is all the way over on the right is the, the column of public service taxes. All the other cities up here, uh, the, the, the lowest three and then the other two we sampled, all levy public service taxes. The city of Palm Coast does not. Uh, that's a fairly significant additional tax source to all of these loca locales. One other thing to kind of note is, uh, for instance, the city of Weston, which has the lowest uh, rate, the taxable value there is about 6.7 billion. Uh, we're considerably lower than that at 3.7 billion. Uh, and if you look at their property tax collections, they're not that different in terms of total taxes collected between the city and the lowest um, city in this group. We took a look at Daytona Beach because uh, they're probably the closest city to us that has a similar population. Um, their taxable value is not that different than ours, but their, their millage rate is, is pushing almost twice our millage rate. Uh, and then Fort Myers, which was the uh, highest taxable value in this group, um, again, their, their tax, our highest millage rate, their taxable value is a little bit more than ours, but their millage rate considerably higher than ours. So this just kind of gives you a sense as to where, where Palm Coast fits in this group. So a lot of folks ask, well, well, what specifically do our property taxes actually pay for? About 65% of the property taxes are for the fire protection, the fire department, and the additional police services that, that we contract with the sheriff's department. The balance primarily is to street and park maintenance with a very small sliver that goes to capital projects. This slide we use at Citizens Academy, and what, what we've done here is we've taken all of the tax revenues that the city gets, not only property taxes, sales taxes, gas taxes, uh, solid waste franchise fees, state revenue sharing, and grants that the city would get from the state and federal government. Including the grants, on average, the city receives $36.50 a month, or $438 per year per resident. Not including grants, the city receives approximately $30 a month or $360 a year per resident in all of these revenue sources. And again, what does the $36.50 a month pay for? Code enforcement, housing programs, street maintenance and resurfacing, all of our emergency services and additional law enforcement, um, and based on Parks and Recs Month, all of our parks, paths, trails, not only the maintenance, but construction and other indirect and related costs. So the balance of, of our tentative budget schedule um, on July 8th, uh, which, which is about a week from today, exactly a week from today, we'll be looking hard at the general fund, uh, moving towards adopting the proposed maximum millage rate. That's the millage rate that goes out on the trim notices in August. Uh, we'll continue with a budget workshops on the proprietary funds, the special revenue and capital funds, culminating at the end of August with the final proposed budget to City Council. Uh, our first budget public hearing is set for September 3rd. That'll be right at 5.05 p.m. And two weeks later will be the final budget hearing also at 5.05 p.m. Any questions? Council questions. Thank you very much, Chris. You know, it's, it's interesting when, when we finally get around to passing the, the final budget and the tax rate, people sometimes say, we, why did you tell me what was going on? <laughs> We've been doing this since January in, in a very public fashion. So. And, and Mr. Mayor, all, 
Actually, I have all pamphlets with me um, of the, the budget at a glance, uh, the PAFR, the Popular Annual Financial Report, which is the, shoot, the short version of our audited financial statements. Um, they're also outside, and I, and I have them with me for anybody that wants them. The glossary. And the glossary. And the glossary. <laughs> uh, and, and Mr. Mayor, all of the, the presentations and reports uh, um, that we do related to this whole process are all out on the city website uh, and available for, for citizen perusal. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Agenda item number, <clears throat> excuse me, number five, an ordinance amending the MPD development agreement for Madison Green and Tuscan Reserve MPD. Mr. Reichman. Mr. Mayor, Council, this is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, amending and restating the Madison Green and Tuscan Reserve Master Plan Development, or MPD, development agreement, as to Tuscan Reserve only, providing for an increase in the maximum residential units on the Tuscan Reserve condominium property from 80 to 115, and providing for re revised development standards on the Tuscan Reserve condominium property, providing for conflicts, for legislative findings and intent, provides for the taking of implementing administrative actions, and it repeals all conflicting ordinances. It provides for severability, non Codification and providing for an effective date. Mr. Mayor, this is quasi judicial. So, any ex parte communications since the first reading uh, should be disclosed. Council members, any ex parte communications to disclose? No, sir. No. Hearing none. I had one citizen contact me about this project. Okay. We can presume that your decision will be based on the, the facts presented here this evening. Your presumption is entirely well founded. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Landon. Mayor, City Council, this is actually a second reading. Angie, if you go ahead and just put the, um, maybe the location. Um, we've had no changes since you, you heard the, uh, this item a couple of weeks ago. It's a rezoning. It's actually, in my opinion, a very positive thing when uh, some of those properties that went idle during the recession are starting to come back. Uh, the, the, the pad sites are there. The infrastructure's there. They're just looking to start going vertical with the, the condominium side of it. As you can see, it's on the north side of State Road 100, uh, just to the, the northwest of uh, the Chevrolet dealership and uh, borders our town center uh, development. So it's a, uh, a uh, prime place right now, a hot spot for us right now for development. Angie's here ready to answer questions, make a presentation if you'd like, but we don't have anything new. Uh, we did change the language to, to show the emergency access will be a hard surface or a surface that can handle the uh, heavy equipment such as big red fire trucks. So uh, with that, we are ready for final approval. Quick question. Um, on signal, signalized uh, intersection analysis, coupled with the roadway segment analysis, what was that all about? <clears throat> that was the traffic study that was submitted along with the rezoning, or rather the zoning amendment application. Um, the applicant submitted as part of the overall package to us. Uh, the traffic study itself would be something that would have to be resubmitted at the time that the site plan is actually submitted to the city. So it will really be finally reviewed and concurrency determined at the time that the site plan is actually submitted for final site plan review. Okay, because I, I see you had done something in 2013 also. Same thing, I would imagine. Uh, they may have submitted a traffic study at that time as well. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, I have a question. The, at the first reading of this, uh, we, uh, some of us questioned whether or not articulated fire equipments could have easy access in egress and, and into this facility. How was that re resolved? And well, what was the upshot of that question? How do, how do we know that I can get a big red fire truck in there and, and get it out and do so in a... That's what engineers do in design and working with the fire department and just making sure the radius is there and make sure the surface can handle it. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's all part of the infrastructure design. Uh, you know, and once again, I mean, fire trucks travel down the same streets the cars do. And, and so they have to have the right radius. You have to, you know, those type of things. But uh, a, a one lane uh, in and out for emergency access uh, works very well for them if they ever have to use that. Um, very confident that, that uh, w they've worked this out so that it's 
not a primary access so that you don't have traffic going through the neighborhood, but it does provide that emergency access. But we, we have somebody on our staff in, in Nestor's group, do we not, that, that is trained in, in fire? Uh, yes. What, yes. We, like we, a fire marshal? F fire marshal. We also have uh, part of our inspectors are, are certified as for fire code review. Uh, this is also an engineering thing when it comes to the street design, the variety of, uh, uh, of experts we have on staff, plus their design team, the, the people who design this uh, have, the, have those same expertise. So I can assume then, uh, if, if I <coughs> hear you correctly, that the experts that we have have reviewed this and signed off on it. Yes, you would not receive anything from us that didn't meet those kind of safety standards. Well, I, I would hope not, but the yes. question needs to be asked. Yes, Thanks. exactly. Other council questions? Seeing so none, open the meeting to the public. Anyone from the public who should be heard on agenda item number five? If so, come up to the podium, give us your name, and your contribution to three minutes. Good evening, council members. My name is Michael Shimento. Uh, represent the uh, applicant. Again, nothing's changed. We resolved some of the language to address the, the mayor's concerns, and we're here to answer any questions you have. We have our engineer here to answer any technical questions, but we're available. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, gentlemen. Dennis McDonald. As you remember, I spoke about this when I was here the, the last time, um, and I've done some research on this. I actually went to the City Hall and asked for some copies of the plans and was um, allowed to have them and uh, reviewed them and actually took them out for review. And so rather than getting into a he said, she said type of thing. What I would ask you to do when you approve this is to make sure that this project is has a sign off from our fire chief. Our first responders uh, need to be considered and um, you know I, I want to hear uh, as a citizen and a taxpayer in the city that uh, our fire chief has in fact signed off on it. I don't want to hear about an engineer. I don't think any of us want to hear about an engineer signing off on this. We want to hear from our fire chief. He's a good guy. Uh, uh, he does an exceptional job, and so does his, his all of his guys. And so I think it, we owe it to him to have a sign-off from our chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker. So you don't approach the podium. We'll close the public meeting. Come back to council. Additional questions, comments, or a motion? Uh, Mr. Landon, just for the benefit of the public, what is the next step in this process? If you approve this tonight, the next step would be to, for them to submit their final site plan. Is where you get into all the details with landscaping and all the inf infrastructure. But the site plan would be the one that, that pins down the, the road radius and so on and so forth. Yeah, the, the, um, that's one of the details, yes. Uh, and um, once again, we've added that language to make sure that the emergency access is, is covered. Okay. Thank you. Additional council questions, comments, or a motion? Well, I'll have a comment, and then I'll make a motion. Um, this is an existing development. This is just some changes to it. The road is there. You can go drive it right now and take a look at it. <laughs> it was approved. Uh, Right. Previously, and to meet all the requirements. So, uh, move approval of agenda number, item number five an ordinance amending the MPD development agreement for the Madison Green and Tuscan Reserve MPD. Second. Moved and second. Roll call vote, please. <coughs> Vice Mayor DiLorenzo? Yes. Councilmember Ferguson? Yes. Councilmember Lewis? Yes. Councilmember McGuire? Yes. Mayor Nets? Yes. Mayor, this motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Agenda item number six, an ordinance uh, with a future, la ma future land use map amendment for three plus or minor acre parcel located at the southwest corner of Seminole Woods Parkway and State Road 100, Mr. Reichman. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council. This is an ordinance um, of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast sort of providing for the amendment of the City of Palm Coast 2035 comprehensive plan as previously amended. 
this uh, is pursuant to section 163.3187 for the statute. And this is amending the future land use map flume for, an, for approximately 3.8 acre parcel from the Flagler County designation of industrial to the city of Palm Coast designation of mixed use. Uh, the subject property described in more, in more detail in the legal description, which is an exhibit to the ordinance. This ordinance provides for conflicts. It provides for ratification of prior acts, codification, severability, and provides for an effective date. Mr. Landon. Mayor City Council, this is the first reading of, of this uh, uh, comprehensive plan amendment or flume uh, amendment. And there's a corresponding uh, rezoning, which is your next item. As usual, we will do one presentation that, that combines the two. This is a, uh, a follow up to the recent annexation of this corner. If you recall, this is the uh, uh, corner of State Road 100 and Seminole Woods. Uh, that was recently annexed in the city as part of our uh, agreement to annex this and, and de-annex a, a portion that will go into the airport. So this is, uh, gets us through the zoning stage, and then after this will be the site plan stage. Uh, Jose, please please provide sure. the details. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members, City Council. For the record, Jose Papa with the Community Development Department. As Mr. Landon said, this is a uh, for parcel that was uh, recently annexed into the city, and just uh, for the benefit of everyone else. Um, the parcel is located at the southwest corner of State Road 100 and Seminole Woods Parkway. Uh, Flagler County Airport's here, and the subject property as shown is hatched in blue here. Again, uh, th this site is about three acres. It was recently annexed into the city. And what we have before us today are two applications. One is to change the future land use map designation, and the other is for a zoning map amendment to change the zoning designation on the property since uh, it is to be part of, of the city. Currently, the site is designated on the flume as industrial. It currently retains its Flagler County designation. What the First Amendment does is to change the industrial land use designation to a mixed use city designation. And as we can see from just the surrounding designations in the area, that mixed use designation is consistent with the, the parcels to the east, which are also designated as mixed use. It's, it is consistent with the parcels to the west, which are in Flagler County, and have a designation of commercial high intensity. Uh, to the north is a portion of the town center PUD and other um, mixed use designations in the city, along with uh, some institutional use. That's where the FPNL have a trans, uh, transfer station. So reviewing the future land use map amendment, again, what we do is we look at the difference in potential development between the current land use designation, which is industrial, and the city mixed use designation, which is uh, the city designation, which is mixed use. And as you can see, an analysis of the maximum intensity shows that there's about a 0 0.10 floor to area ratio difference between a mixed use designation and the county industrial designation. And then again, also, our mixed-use designation allows a, allows, potentially allows residential uses. And uh, that amount of density is about 15 units, 12, 15 dwelling units per acre. So potentially if someone wanted to develop this site for, for residential, it could be up to 45 units per acre. But again, remember that there is a companion zoning map amendment to general commercial for this site. And a review of the public infrastructure that the, the net, net difference between what is proposed and what exists, uh, that difference, uh, public, public infrastructure is available to serve that difference. Uh, we have the water and wastewater treatment facilities available. The amount of traffic being produced as presented in the staff report would not be significant enough to bring the level of service down on any of the adjacent roads. And reviewing the comprehensive plan, we find that the proposed uh, future land use map amendment is consistent, as previously stated, with the existing flume of the surrounding areas. It, it is also consistent with the comprehensive plan in that objective 1.1.4 is there states to promote compact and contiguous development, a mixture of land uses, and to discourage urban sprawl. This amendment meets all of those criteria and, again, is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So our findings for the future land use map amendment is that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, there is no impact on the level of service for public service and infrastructure, and it is consistent with the surrounding land uses. Similarly with the zoning map amendment, the current zoning map designation for the parcel, subject parcel, is industrial Flagler County zoning designation. Uh, what's being proposed is a zoning map designation, city designation of general commercial, or COM2. Again, looking at the surrounding uh, properties, what you have to the south are, is more Flagler County industrial uh, zoning designations. To the west is a PUD in the county. To the east are uh, general commercial designated lands, which are in the city. And again, to the north, we have a portion of town center, which is designated MPD, and some high intensity commercial COM3 to, to the northwest. Um, also, across the street on Seminole Woods, you have office uses, which is the Pinnacles uh, office park. Reviewing the criteria in the land development code for zoning change, we'll find that th this proposed amendment is consistent with the, with the criteria in, in the land development code for zoning change. The proposed change is on an expanding commercial corridor with adequate capacity for, for public facilities and, and the impact of, of development on that property. It is not contrary to public interest or health, safety, and welfare. Again, the proposed change is appropriate on the busy commercial corridor. And we also find that this proposed zoning map amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The permitted zoning, the proposed zoning district is consistent or permitted within the companion uh, future land use map designation. Again, it is compatible with the surrounding uses and public infrastructure is available to serve this development. As a result, staff, along with the Planning and Land Development Regulation Board, recommended approval for both applications. We, both staff and PLDRB recommend that City Council approve the proposed flume amendment for the three-acre parcel at the southwest corner of State Road 100 and Seminole Woods Parkway from industrial to mixed use. Similarly, staff and again, Planning Land Development Regulation Board recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment for the same three acre parcel from industrial to general commercial. And that concludes staff presentation. Oh, just a, and just as a follow up, again, this is first reading, so we will have a second reading if approved tonight at the, second, at the next uh, City Council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Council questions? Seeing none, we'll open the meeting to the public. There are two items that were in the presentation, agenda items six and seven. We will vote on them separately, but you're welcome to comment on either or both since they are integrally related. Anyone wish to speak on agenda items six or seven? Please approach the podium, give us your name. Limit your contribution to three minutes. We see nobody approaching the podium, so we'll close the public portion of the meeting, come back to council. Additional questions, comments, or a motion? I move to approve. Second. This is on agenda item number six. Yes. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor DiLorenzo? Yes. Councilmember Ferguson? Yes. Councilmember Lewis? Yes. Councilmember McGuire? Yes. Mayor Ness? Yes. Mayor, this motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Agenda item number seven, which is the companion zoning map amendment. Um, again, I'll offer the opportunity to the public if anyone wishes to speak on agenda item seven separately. Mr. Mayor, I think we need to read the title. Yes. Oh, please do. I make that mistake twice in a row. And this is quasi judicial. This is the uh, ordinance of the City of Council of the City of Palm Coast for providing for the amendment of the official zoning map as established in Section 2.06 of the City of Palm Coast Unified Land Development Code, amending the zoning designation for approximately 3.0 acres of certain real property from industrial, which is the Flagler County zoning designation, to general commercial or COM2, which is the City of Palm Coast zoning designation, as described in more detail in the legal description, which is an exhibit to the ordinance. This ordinance provides for conflict, severability, and, and provides for an effective date. Again, this is a quasi a judicial hearing. Are there any ex parte communications to be disclosed? No. No. None. None. Mr. Landon, anything further to add? No. Nope. Last presentation covers it for us. Okay. Council, no questions, comments? So we'll accept a motion on uh, agenda item number seven. Move to approve agenda item number seven. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor DiLorenzo? Yes. Council Member Ferguson? Yes. Council Member Lewis? Yes. 
Council Member McGuire? Yes. Mayor Nett? Yes. Mayor, this motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Agenda item number eight, a resolution approval of the final plat for Country Club Harbor replat. Mr. Landon. Mayor City Council, you're, you're getting a full uh, uh, gamut of uh, land use type uh, issues uh, tonight. This one being a, a final plat for a single family development that uh, was recently approved by city council. So this is uh, one of the final steps before they can actually start constructing homes. Constance will give you the, the details tonight. Thank you, Mr. Landon. Good evening, mayor and council members. Good evening. Uh, this is Country Club Harbor, uh, replat, um, final plat application 2671. It is a replat of the Country Club Cove section five and section eight. I will also mention that the applicant is here this evening if there are any questions. The uh, location of the property was the old model center site. It's south of Clubhouse Drive. It includes Sesame Island and it is surrounded by the Palm Harbor Golf Course. The future land use of the property is residential and the zoning of the property is single family residential and parks and greenway for the Sesame Island and the plat meets the requirements of that zoning district. Some uh, attributes to the plat is it's a total acreage of 29.18. Um, the Sesame Island is 7.35 acres of that plat, and the plat has private roadways, and the density is half of what the maximum is allowed for that zoning district. This is a representation of the northern part of the property on the plat, and tract E is designated on the plat as an emergency access. The southern part of the plat includes Sesame Island, which is track G, that is put into a park and tree preservation track. The applicant has also submitted to the city a request to mitigate the concurrency reservation fees um, so with that mitigation, there will be a condition on the plant that um, the interlocal agreement for public school facility planning uh, be, the requirements be met by either the mitigation or the payment of those reservation fees. So the staff recommends that city council adopt resolution approving final plat for Country Club Harbor replat and authorizing mayor to execute the plat and staff to issue a final plat development order for application 2671 subject to meeting the requirements of the interlocal agreement for public school facility planning. And that would conclude the presentation. Council questions. Uh, Constant, we put the map back up, please. Yeah. Uh, one more back. One more? Yeah. Okay. The, um, the, I, on my map on my iPad, I couldn't open because of the size of it. So the, the lots that are, I guess that's east of the bridge. I remember when this came uh, to us the first time, there was some discussion if they were going to be able to develop those lots or not. And how was that resolved? I couldn't tell from, from this. It was, excuse me. It was resolved by um, having a shared access point through one of the lots, so there will only be one access onto Clubhouse Drive. What we're referring to are those two lots. Correct. Here. That's what I'm referring to. They have to. direct access to Clubhouse, and so instead of having two separate driveways, they'll have one shared driveway. Okay. That will serve both of those um, parcels. Which I believe is um, consistent with the houses to the, the other side of that. Across the street, you'll see the same same kind of um, makeup, yes. Right, okay. Are there council questions? Seeing none, we'll open the meeting to the public, and for the public wish to be heard on agenda item number eight.
Good evening, John Hurt Belding, Palm Coast. I remember when this was uh, brought up a few months ago and maybe I missed the answers or maybe I missed what y'all decided to do with this. But the question was about that seven something acres called Sesame Island. That seven acres, as I understand it, unless y'all have changed and given it to the developers, that 7.5 acres belongs to the citizens of Palm Coast with absolutely zero access unless we want to go four-wheeling across the golf course to get there. I would ask and I would recommend that unless the citizens of Palm Coast have access to that seven and a half acre fine little private park that you would all turn it away and not give permission to do that. That seven and a half acres belongs to the citizens of Palm Coast. It doesn't belong to the developers and it doesn't belong to the private community, the gated community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. <coughs> Seeing no one approach the podium, we we'll close the public portion meeting and come back to council. The issue of Sesame Island. Yes. The, the gentleman uh, recalls a conversation that we had during the zoning, uh, but the fact of it is it is privately owned. It is not owned by the city. It's not publicly owned whatsoever. The developer um, offered it to the city if city council would like to um, accept a dedication of that property. Uh, but the, the gentleman was also correct in the fact that uh, it wasn't going to have public access. Uh, and at that time, city council said no. If it's going to just have uh, private access from this particular uh, subdivision, then it needs to stay private and, and not be a, a, public, uh, a public park. So the proposal here is that um, uh, seven and a third acre will stay private. It will be owned in, uh, by the homeowners association that will be established as part of this, this residential development, uh, which was what the direction of city council at the time was zoning. Uh, and so we've consistent with that. So this is not publicly owned property now, and it's not proposed to be publicly owned property in the future. Developers have always said that if the city wants it, they would be willing uh, to dedicate it. But once again, it really doesn't have good public access. And of course, with public ownership comes liability and comes maintenance responsibilities. Right. And to the extent that our residents would not benefit from this, I see no point in our owning it, maintaining it, or accepting liability for but, it. But part of the zoning and part of this action, it, it, it will be preserved as trees and the, the trees will stay there. Back to City Council. Uh, additional questions, comments, or a motion? Move for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries without objection. Agenda item number nine, resolution approving the nuisance abatement initial assessment. Mr. Landon. Mayor City Council, this is a uh, an annual approval. Uh, what it basically amounts to is, is um, uh, every year we have uh, property that uh, the property owners do not maintain to our, our uh, uh, minimum standards and we use tax dollars to mow the lawn, to take care of nuisances, whatever the issue is, whether they're in violation of, of our uh, maintenance code. Uh, and then what this resolution does is allows us to actually uh, transfer those those costs to the people via their property tax and it actually becomes a lien on the property that has the same priority as, as property tax so that um, they the property owners will be billed so that uh, when they pay their property tax or when the, the property is, is sold uh, the taxpayers are reimbursed for um, any costs associated with maintaining their property. Uh, this is a required public hearing where you give people an opportunity to uh, speak here and then they will get notices. Uh, Mr. De Lorenzo at the workshop asked that we try to do a little something explaining that this was, you're getting this notice because we actually spent money on your property to maintain it. Uh, we've tried to add that but still stay within the required state law language. Uh, 
after they get the notice, after tonight, they will have the opportunity to appeal any of this and go through that process. Um, and um, anybody who is uh, s still is found to have, um, you know, basically not taking care of their property and the city use tax dollars, they will have this assessment on their taxes. Hopefully that explained it well, and the attorney may um, want to add to that, because it really is a legal process. This is part of the process. It's provided for by Chapter 197. It provides a really invaluable tool to your um, code enforcement staff to deal with nuisances. That's the whole purpose of this is nuisance abatement. So it provides a, 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 an efficient and fair uh, uh, method to deal with, with properties that are in communities that are not being maintained and are creating problems for their neighbors. And also it's fair to the taxpayers because the costs to the community are reimbursed through um, people paying their taxes. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice, efficient process that's provided for by Florida law under Chapter 197. Mr. Reisman, if, if a lien is placed on a property for failure to pay this sort of thing, is this fall into the category, I don't remember the term, like a super lien, that if the property is closed, we get our money first? It has the same priority. It's not, it's not eliminated if, uh, by, by a tax lien. In other words, it's the same thing. People don't pay this. It's like they're not paying their valorum real estate taxes. And a tax certificate can be issued if this is not paid, as opposed to other types of city liens or other government liens that can be wiped out or eliminated when a tax certificate or a tax deed is issued for non-payment of, of, of ad valorem or taxes. Or a mechanics lien placed. Correct. Back. That's correct. So this, this is a higher priority. That's what's so valuable about it. Okay. And just be sure everybody's clear on this. This has nothing to do with collecting fines that the Code Enforcement Board might levy for failing to abide by our property maintenance uh, codes. This is reimbursement of the city for actual dollars spent where there have been determined to be nuisances that are detrimental to the uh, local residents. To the and and the, most, the most common is when you have a lot that's vacant and it's just overgrown and you've got vermin and you've got um, all sorts of things that are coming out onto the, the streets and the next door neighbors and, and this provides a, a quick efficient tool to, to get rid of that nuisance that's in the community that's really creating a, a, a problem for, for a neighborhood. I, I, I noticed on the uh, agenda uh, detail of all of the specific properties and the amount of money, but I didn't have the time or the inclination to add it up. Do we have a number that 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 uh, money has been spent that we will be trying or we will be billing a total, approximately, just to get a, an order of magnitude number, Mr. Quinn. The uh, the list before you is approximately two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred k. This is the preliminary list. Of course, we'll we'll still have I'm sure payments and and uh, uh, typically once the notices go out, some things are paid and satisfied uh, with code enforcement. But the starting list right now is two hundred thousand. Last year's list was somewhere in the area of two hundred eighty thousand. So it's in, it's gone down and. From last year, it's gone down from last year. Not the same properties as last year, right. but it's gone down from last year. But this is a rolling number, is it not, Chris? It, you know, it really depends on how much nuisance abatement the city does. Right, but it's, but a, it's a new number every year. Right, that's what I meant. Yes, it's a new number every year. And we collect what percent of that typically? Uh, we have actually collected most of last year's levy at this point. I'd, I'd say we're pushing 85 plus percent. It's a bigger number than most people would imagine, I, I, than I would have imagined anyway, speaking for myself. And, 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 and the good news is you will eventually collect 99 percent of this because when a piece of property is foreclosed, uh, whether it be for tax lien or whatever, uh, the first the first things that get paid are your ad valorem property taxes, and this would get paid. Then, if there's any value left over, it would go to mortgage holders and so on and so forth. So, and eventually, we, we will collect 
the lion's share. I think the city staff would, would, would say that they would hope that this number will progressively decrease as far as these types of resolutions coming forward because we're coming out of some times where there were a lot of foreclosures and I think there were, you could, you could show that there's a correspondence between the foreclosures and the parcels that are identified in the exhibit to this resolution um, that uh, where, where these, these actions have been taken by the city to try to help out the neighbors. Other council questions? Open the meeting to the public. Anyone from the public wish to be heard on agenda item number nine? Seeing so no one approach the podium, we'll close the public portion. Moving back to council. Additional questions, comments, or motion? Move to approve. Second. I have a quick comment. Please. Uh, the additional language in the letter is perfect, I think. It really makes a difference explaining what the, why, um, why the, they're receiving it. I will say thank you for the staff that put that together. Yeah. It was a team approach. Yeah. I think it's perfect. They specifically forced us not to add anything. <laughs> <laughs> On agenda item number time, we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries without objection. This brings us to the consent agenda items 10 through 16. I'd like to offer the opportunity to the public to comment on any of these items uh, before council acts on them uh, as a consent agenda. If there's number 11. And we just see what number 11 is. Okay. That's the city lease. Anything else? Council members, is there a motion to approve agenda items 10 and 12 through 16? So moved. I have a question on number 12. I'm not terribly familiar with the, uh, with that. Uh, Would you like to remove, well, we'll remove, we'll remove 12 also. Looking for a motion on 13 through 16. Move to approve. Second. I, I think you uh, mean 10, 10, 10 I'm sorry. 16. No, uh, yes, 10 and 13 through 16. Move approval. Moved, second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries that objection. All right. Agenda item number 11. Uh, Mr. Landon, this is the proposed resolution of the lease amendment between the City of Palm Coast and the offices of City Marketplace. Well, I think most people at this point know that we are uh, paying rent where we are right now in City Marketplace. Our, our current lease ex uh, expires the end of October of this year. Uh, the new City Hall uh, is scheduled to start construction about that time and then be completed by uh, no later than November of 2015. So what we propose and we, what we need is one, one additional year on the lease. Uh, the history of this is that the landlord proposed uh, a significant uh, rate increase on us, if you will. Same thing they're proposing for all the tenants in there, in this case 57%, went from uh, what we're currently paying at, at $240,000 annually to almost a $140,000 increase or, or $380,000, just under that figure. Uh, we said at that, that it's time to go look, see if we can find a cheaper home, which we could, but uh, they didn't, um, they decided that they didn't want to lose us, so they agreed to a uh, substantial reduction in only a, a, a $22,000 increase or a 10% increase. Uh, yes, it is an increase, but it is still, if you consider the cost of moving twice, the downtime, um, you know, address changes, all those uh, uh, things, uh, we believe that the smart business thing to do is stay where we are for, for additional year under this one-year lease uh, and um, uh, would recommend approval. Council questions? Since this was removed from the agenda, we'll give the public an opportunity. Does anyone wish to speak on agenda item number 11? Yeah, Cal, Palm Coast. If we uh, take it for another year and uh, there's an overrun on the building, do we have to go for another year? Or is there, you have some kind of a stipulation that, you know, if, if it takes longer than night 2015, let's say it goes into 2016, January 2016, or a day after 
our leases up, what happens? Do we have to renew it, or or did we just get an extension? We'll get you an answer to that. Next week on agenda item number 11. Seeing no one approach the podium, we'll close the public portion meeting, go back to council. Mr. Land, in the unlikely event that construction is delayed and we can't move into the new facility as anticipated, what are the provisions? First of all, I, I, my math wasn't very good, so I'm going to correct that. 10% of 240,000 is 24,000, yes. not 22,000. So I, uh, but to answer the question, uh, yeah, I, you obviously depends on if that happens. I will tell you, first of all, the likelihood of that happen is not real great because they're hoping that we would move in in, in the August, September timeframe. So this gives us some cushion there to uh, if there are delays. But if there are delays, and obviously then you um, negotiate an extension. Uh, uh, obviously we'd want to do month to month at that point. Uh, and usually landlords would uh, agree to a month to month knowing that you know the building's about finished uh, so but we definitely would not be interested in any kind of long-term one-year lease six months lease etc we'd have to cross that bridge when it came to um, and you know but uh, once again this particular one-year lease gives us some cushion we, we should uh, be able to get in the new building before October 31st In 2015, I want to make sure that's clear, not, not 2014. <laughs> Any council additional questions, comments, or a motion on number 11? I have a comment, Your Honor. Mr. Landon, uh, the construction management uh, contract that we're contemplating entering into has a fixed price in it, you know, that not to exceed. Right. But does it also have a performance clause that says that if they don't finish by a certain time, unless it's due to an act of God, are we due any remuneration? Standard. Um, it's, it's going to include the, the provision, which is in almost, almost yeah. every construction contract, providing for a term, providing for a, a number of days that they have to, to finish. And if they do not finish, that, that liquidated damages that start to accrue on a per diem basis. So they are, in essence, penalized. This is common in, in, in many, many, many construction contracts. And, and they, are, they are crafted in a fashion so that it doesn't become a penalty, but becomes enough of a hurt so that there's a tremendous financial incentive for the for the contractor to complete the project in a timely fashion. So it, it's reasonable to assume then that if this condition were to exist, the penalty dollars collected would offset the need to continue a, a current arrangement. Very, very good point, yes. Uh, one, one clarification, we already have the contract. It just doesn't have the final fixed price. That has come back to you, and that's scheduled, I think, is in September. Uh, but I do recall in negotiations with that contract, we did have, I don't remember the details, but I do know we have that penalty that, that Mr. Reichman referred to. So any, uh, if we, <coughs> small chance ever went into uh, November of 15, that yes, there would be penalties on the contractor to pay for that. Now, of course, if it's caused by uh, a hurricane or something. Yeah, you know, act of God. The act of God, then, then that's, uh, uh, that's in there too. It's called force majeure. Uh, I think is how you pronounce it. Yes, that, um, force majeure. Um, uh, you know, it's not their fault, not our fault. It, it, then nobody would have a penalty. Thank you. Additional comments? Motion on number 11? Move approval. Second. second. Move and second. All in favor <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries without objection. Agenda item number 12, resolution approving a school concurrency mitigation agreement with the Flagler County School Board and the owners of Country Club Harbor. Uh, Mr. Ferguson asked us to be removed for some explanation of what this is all about. Yes. Um, well, state law, um, just like uh, many of the impacts new development causes, uh, requires new development to pay for itself. And in this case, it's school concurrency or school impact fees. and, and um, uh, Flagler County School District is no different. They, they have an impact fee requirement. But um, when this law was first put into effect and, and our interlocal agreement that says the city will collect these fees when development occurs, it was during boom times. 
uh, we had multiple uh, mobile units at most of the schools and uh, the school district was under a lot of construction. So the way our agreement with the school district reads is that because there wasn't any space in our schools that we didn't want to um, artificially have space reserved that we made developers pay uh, up front at the time of planning to uh, reserve all the space. Basically did their impact fees in advance. Well, since that time, things have changed. We have a letter in the file that says there is plenty of a space in our schools to handle the few students that would come from the 54 lots. Uh, and so what this, in, in our agreement with the school district allows for is these mitigation agreements that basically says instead of requiring the payment at the time of planning, that we would require the impact fees at the time a building permit is full, pulled. So the fee amount is the same, it's per lot, flat amount, but instead of having them pay up front because there is no reservation issues right now for a small plant like this, that they can pull those as individual uh, houses come. So the benefit to the developer is that if it takes five years to build out the thing, they don't have all that money committed for these impact fees ahead of time. Right, and, and sometimes builders, uh, developers who actually create the lots will have multiple builders. Right. And this makes the builder who actually builds a house and creates the, the home uh, uh, pay the fee at that time versus the person putting in the, the streets and the okay. utilities. But yes, that's the concept. The, the timing is the issue. Time, timing is the issue and, and uh, cash flow. I mean, you know, uh, instead of putting it all up front and then waiting for multiple months or years before they can sell those lots or sell the homes, uh, basically the fees are paid at the time they have a sale of the home or close to it. Thank you. Mr. DeLorenzo. Well, I would like to put the dollars to what your explanation, okay? This, this project is uh, 54 units that, uh, according to the school study, that would represent a, just over 17 students that it could potentially produce. And the impact fee for those 17 students is $195,000. And if uh, you're asking the uh, developers right now in this time uh, where there's a you know, few dollars and difficult to make performers work, the putting $200,000 up front to do a quality development like this, it just doesn't work. And so they've gone to the school district and said, hey, uh, if scattered lots pay, the, at building per, uh, pay their impact fees at building permit, and uh, you have plenty of room for my potential 17 kids, so I would like to pay at building permit too. If I could also piggyback on that is um, we did this same thing for the last plat, which was Hidden Lakes. And then we've also um, annually, the, the, all the cities and the county and the school district are supposed to get together and, and talk about you know, where we are with this. And we're gonna propose that we change in our local to allow for this, at least right now when there's plenty of capacity. The other thing I would add is we're having the same issue with, with water. Sewer, we're very, very tight, as you know, but water, we have plenty of capacity, and we require both water and sewer up front. So you're gonna see some, some requests to take a look at how do we make sure that we don't have fictitious lots they wanna reserve for, but, but also make it so it's realistic. Because until the home is built, there is no impact on water, sewer, schools. So, and we get the impact fees at building permit, not when they close, so we do get it before we have the actual impact on the systems. Thank you. Other council questions? We'll open the uh, meeting to the public. Anything from the public wish to be heard on agenda item number 12. We'll approach the podium. We'll close the public portion meeting. Go back to council. Any additional questions, comments, or a motion? Motion to approve. Second. second. Move and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries that objection. This brings us to the public participation portion of the meeting. This is the opportunity for the public to speak on any item not on today's agenda. Please approach the podium. Give us your name. Limit your contribution to three minutes. John Erpelding, Palm Coast again. I've got three things uh, real quick. 
Uh, one is uh, we've talked about the uh, foreclosing on some people's property. There's a property across the street from me on Riviera, and Jason may know where it's at. But the people, unfortunate, have apparently been foreclosed on. They've moved out. They're, they're gone. The grass is two feet high. My problem isn't so much with that as it is with the last time they were there about three weeks ago, these people put uh, waste management tubs, a blue tub and a green tub, out front for uh, waste management to pick up. Uh, waste management won't pick them up, and they're just sitting there. And they've been sitting there for three weeks. Uh, what do we do about uh, getting waste management to pick up the trash that's been sitting there for three weeks? Now I understand it's in there, you know, in a uh, recycled tub, but that's not my fault nor my responsibility. Uh, belongs to waste management, whether they're trashed, broken, or whatever. But it is trash laying out there on the street. It's unsightly and it needs to be picked up. Another thing I've got is, is you know, we've uh, we put uh, uh, awards for our water in the city of Palm Coast. Uh, my question is, is over by the library, if anybody rides by the li library, drives by the library with a window open, it smells like my grandpa's old open house uh, outhouse. There's got to be something done. I mean, it really does. Uh, land and laughs, but and he, but he knows what I'm talking about. It stinks. It stinks bad. Let's get an extra bag of lime and throw it in the tank. I don't know what you do with it, but uh, that's that's just wrong. I have a neighbor that has the same problem right next door, so I can relate to it. Yeah, and I mean, really, it's just it shouldn't be something that's a major problem. Uh, thanks, by the way, for the explanation on Sesame Island. I just wasn't here and wasn't aware of what had happened with that, and uh, that was a good explanation. I appreciate it. Uh, last but not least, on the uh, I'm going to touch real quick on these yard sale signs one more time. I think uh, you know we need to let up on the people having yard sales signs. Uh, I would hope that the citizens show a great deal more restraint towards the political advertising that's going to be going on in the campaign season coming here than our code enforcement shows towards them and their yard, yard sale signs. Because uh, <laughs> they're all in violation. You know the word that, word that everybody's in violation. That code should be changed. People should be allowed to have yard sales. They just should be uh, nailed after the signs have been up for too long or whatever, you know, find if they, if they don't come down by Monday. I don't know how you do that. I don't really know what the answer is. But uh, code enforcement sure is out there in force and tearing them down on people. I know one woman, again, was foreclosed and she was going to be out on, a, out on the street. So she was having a yard sale, trying to make what she could make, and here comes code enforcement spouting at her what she can't do, you know. Uh, 15 seconds. That's all. That Really, that's all. I, uh, main thing was is the uh, trash pickup and the uh, smell at the uh, library. Thanks. Thank Next speaker. Good evening. My name is George Mayo from here in Palm Coast. Uh, just on the lighter side tonight, maybe the end of the agenda, for those of you who don't know, I happen to be retired, and my main job now is watching prices right and then figuring out everything afterwards. <laughs> One of the main prizes for the showcase this week, or I sorry, a week ago, was they give out trips all the time for those you may watch, be, be Paris, Rome, Chicago, New York City, was to fly to from LA to Daytona Beach, Florida, to pick up a rental car to drive to Palm Coast, Florida for a five-night stay in Hammock Beach Resort. So I think if they're giving out trips on national TV to Palm Coast, Florida, I just want to thank everybody for what you've done, and I think we have arrived. Good evening. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> Next speaker. Dennis McDonald. I wanted to use tonight as, as kind of a starting point, as a, um, a place to move forward here between the city and the county and what I see as major issues on fire um, and the first responders. 
what was stated about the project that had been approved before and so it must comply is, is not the case. I sat with the, the county fire marshal, it doesn't comply. But it can be repaired, that's the point. And we need to be working with the county and the city fire staff and all of these people do a great job and I don't understand why they're not being called into the planning process early on so that you don't have a bottleneck later on. That's what I have done in the past for 40 years and uh, I don't understand why it's not being done here. I found out during the process when I went and picked up the site plans that nobody asked the county and I also found out there there hasn't been any inclusion on the city. I find that to be absolutely wrong. Uh, the fire people need to be included in the, in the planning process and every one of you gentlemen who sits on this council, you need to be assured of the fact that our fire chief and our fire marshal and the people in the county have signed off on this. Case in point, this project tonight. Who's going to be the first responder to, to that project when it goes in? The county. The fire department's right across the street. It's, it's obvious where these guys are going to come from and it's a constant give and take. These guys don't have a line, this is the city and this is the county or whatever. They all do a great job. They're here to protect us. And so what I'm asking you to do is move forward on a new policy where the fire department is included, both county and city, on any kind of new projects that you do from here on in. And I, I would like a commitment from you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker. So you don't approach the podium and close the public portion meeting and come back to council. But first, Mr. Landon, um, it's not waste management, it's waste pro, but Yes, and we, we need to get that stuff picked we, up. We, we get it picked up. I, I've got to say, though, that um, the biggest complaint probably Waste Pro gets is when people pick up things, or the, the trash hauler picks up things that people didn't intend for them to pick up. You know, their favorite trash can that they was set out there they thought was part of the trash. But if we oh, have... No, wait a minute. I had just the other problem. I tried to throw out a trash can. And, and, but they won't take they it. They wouldn't. We, we, we recently, I think it was a, a weed eater. The guy uh, left it out in his swale uh, and, and went in and got something to drink and came back and, and his trash was gone along with his weed eater. Uh, you know. I put my mother-in-law out there in her wheelchair. She sat there for three days and they wouldn't get it. Yeah. So, but uh, anytime we have this, we, we can, particularly if it's out in the right of way, we'll get it picked up. Okay. And then the issue uh, is the odor at the library. I'm not aware of uh, that. It, there a, is an odor. When you come in to come up Belter to make a right turn on Palm Coast Parkway, there's some kind of a treatment facility that's that's there. That and when the wind is right, it, it, the gentleman's right, it'll knock you down. I go by it every day too. R Richard, is this? Uh, uh, one of our pump stations, or is this a, a well that has that sulfur water? No, it, it is a major um, uh, master's pump station on the corner. Very um, uh, lousy location, but it was one of the first pump stations west of I-95. It does have an odor control unit on it. Um, we'll have to check and make sure it's been serviced properly, but it is, it basically handles all the wastewater north of Palm Coast Parkway and um, all the way up to Matanzas uh, Woods and all the way part even uh, down Pine Lakes. So it's it's a major, major repump station and unfortunately sewer doesn't smell good. I'd like to, if you don't mind, uh, th this obviously sounds like it's that pump station. I don't, I don't want to say otherwise, but uh, uh, we get the complaint quite often when it's actually uh, irrigation water yeah. that has a, a smell. It's going to be maybe a different smell, but it smells like rotten eggs. Richard, explain that a little bit, because I know that uh, neighbors complain about, well, you know, my irrigation, my neighbor's irrigation's on. I have that in my neighborhood, and it yeah, really... There, there's uh, a lot of areas within various water tables that there's high sulfur content in the water, and it does smell like rotten eggs. And it is the same chemical compound that gets released by sewer, uh, raw sewage when it gets stirred up. So a lot of times it can smell just like that. A lot of times it is irrigation um, when it's not really sewer. 
This, uh, right on the corner of the library though, it, there is a pump station and I do know that at times it has issues with odor. And, and like I said, we do have an odor control unit on it, but unfortunately you can't totally control owner odors in the sewer system. I see uh, city employees out there working on that on yeah. a fairly regular basis. Is that a major, major maintenance thing for you? Oh, absolutely. It's one of, uh, it's one of our major repump stations, so it requires constant maintenance we we hit those stations visit those stations almost on a daily basis of the major repump stations no less than three times a week but there is a lot of maintenance to it because there's a lot of flow and um, and so that's you know it's just one of those but, things but a lot of flow is a lot better than no flow at all in this case that's true yes that's true and it does you know there's a significant portion of that station's flow comes from uh, up in the B section in the and the Matanzas Woods section which is all PEP which is uh, septic sewage so there's more odors to that than there is to other domestic sewers so odor control is an issue in a number of stations uh, we have uh, in our budget on an annual basis additional odor control units as these stations get higher and higher flows they become more and more of an issue with odor so we have a we have a, a budget line item for odor control units and uh, what does uh, an odor control unit do Richard how does it work uh, basically the the whole time these sewers are open to the there's a vent to yep. the sewer system you can't plug it all off because then you trap gases that could become dangerous so they release gases all the time and the odor control unit basically filters that gas and there's a number of different methods to control the odors but the method that we're utilizing is uh, uh, basically pack towers that uh, filter the air is that gas flammable uh, it, I suppose in, in concentrated forms it can be, yes, but okay. uh, that's why it's important to release it and not let it get trapped and stay in the sewer system. I have a adjacent question. <laughs> the pump stations around town, um, one at Rimfire and Ravenwood uh, comes to mind, um, which is one of our newer ones, or re new one we re replaced or something. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't keep the bushes very high, and it's it's kind of a tall unit, and it's conspicuous. Is it conspicuous on purpose for security reasons, or can we let the bushes grow up so it's not so conspicuous? Right? Conspicuous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I guess we could talk to our landscape architect, but obviously there are security issues. And guess what? The tall part of it is the odor control unit. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, you might look at our newest beachside sewer station, and it's got a great big tall tower, and that is the odor control unit. And, and I would discourage from not being able to see into them because it's not a good place for you want people to hide out and the, the bushes are intended to uh, uh, soften it somewhat mm -hmm. but you don't want it to not be visible i mean it's that particular one is directly adjacent to a house that one too is a major repump station right and uh it was like you said recently upgraded it was it's always been there it's been there since the subdivision was built it's always been there but it was recently upgraded with uh, a, a new wet well and all new pumps and uh, diesel generator backup power and an odor control unit, uh, some of the latest, greatest odor control units. And I ride my bicycle by there on a regular basis and it still smells. Richard, Richard <laughs> sometimes, uh, some years ago, we used to get complaints about odor on the old the southern part of um, Palm Coast, down there, um, I would say um, Cypress Knolls and maybe the, um, some of the areas uh, on, the, on the other side of 100. Now, I haven't heard, heard or read anything about odors lately. Mm -hmm. Are those the same pumps we're talking about? Yeah, there's there's 150 pump stations out there, and some of them are major repump stations, and some of them are smaller pump stations. The pump stations in the area where we have PEP systems 
are a little more problematic than other areas because the PEP system produces a, a sewer effluent that is septic and releases odors more, um, uh, more so than a gravity system. And like I said, we have budgeted on an annual basis more odor control units for these pump stations each year. But with 150 pump stations and about a $30,000 per uh, odor control unit, we can't afford to go out and pop odor control units in all 150 stations. So we're doing them a little bit at a time, and we hit the ones that as, they, as the flow increases, uh, the odors increase, and that's how we prioritize which ones get odor control. Uh, also, the proximity to homes is another factor. So yeah, there's a lot of stations that we've added odor control. There's one down on Beltaire in, in the Cypress Knolls area right on Beltaire, another major repump station. And the more flow they get, the more odors they release. And that one also has an odor control unit on it. I, I, but as far as historical, a lot of the odor control units have been installed by, by the city in the last few years. Um, Correct. And so we have been trying to address these uh, complaints, particularly when you live next to one. You um, can only imagine uh, having your neighbor's irrigation on all the time uh, and, and smell that way because it basically would be continuous. So we have uh, invested in trying to minimize that. What I find is that the residents that are close to these don't complain after we put the odor control unit in. That doesn't mean when you walk by it, you can't smell it, but it's from inside your home, et cetera. It controls it to the point where it's it's not uh, unbearable trying to sleep at night, which is the case sometimes when the, the these, uh, we, we saw all the growth and, and these units were um, getting quite a bit of flow without the, the control. So, and if you hear a complaint, yeah, they do take maintenance. We do have, they have to be clean. It's like anything else. It's got, it's got to be cleaned out, et cetera. You know, we'll take a look at it. But, uh, uh, and if we have one that doesn't have a, a, a control, uh, odor control unit on it, uh, we can uh, take a look at whether it meets our, our criteria that might be one we need to add in the future. And uh, Mr. Lannon, I would suggest, I'm sure Richard looks at it, but are we using state-of-the-art equipment? And the reason I say that is I spent a majority of my working life uh, in the foundry industry. And when you smelt and melt a lot of uh, raw metals, you get hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide. And we had to have stacked scrubbers all over the place because of the EPA requirements, but they did the job. No one in the community complained. I have seen actual reports on comparing some of the different uh, options. Uh, Richard, you may dr address that further, but you know I think we're trying to get the most efficient. Yeah, absolutely. We we've actually uh, tried three or four different uh, technologies and trying to zero in on the one that is most effective, um, but also have to be cost effective. If you throw enough money at it, you can stop all odors, uh, but that doesn't play out too well in the in the rates so we we have to we have to use a reasonable system but we we do um, keep up with the latest technology and make sure we try out see what works the best thank you uh, another issue was raised was the yard sale signs I don't know if we want to revisit that mr. De Lorenzo you were uh, interested in that one when it was first addressed Perhaps we can take a look at that at a workshop. No, I would like to. Okay. All right. Discussion by City Council of matters not on the agenda. Mr. Ferguson, we'll start with you, sir. I have nothing to offer you, Mayor. Mr. De Lorenzo. Uh, Jose and I attended the TPO meeting uh, last week, last Wednesday, and uh, we are ever so close to being able to vote at that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, seven of the interlocal agreements had been uh, returned to the TPO. There is no TPO meeting for July, and they anticipate that all of them will be returned uh, for the August meeting, and we will officially, officially, officially become a voting member of the TPO. Here, here. <laughs> Mr. Lewis. Nope. Mr. McGuire. No, sir. Discussion by city attorney of matters not on the agenda. Oh boy. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, Council, I have several items. First, actually, is an agenda item. It's uh, agenda item number 17, and it's a resolution approving a settlement agreement that was uh, uh, discussed and negotiated and, and uh, agreed to by the representatives of the city that attended a mediation uh, with uh, 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 Gus and, and Colleen Ajram, and, and um, I, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with, with uh, the, the, those property owners. They own um, uh, uh, several parcels of property that are right near the intersection of State Road 100 and Bulldog Drive. The specific address is 92 and, and 108 Bulldog Drive, and um, in fact, the, the uh, improvements that are going out there are, are just finishing in front of their property and moving beyond their property, and they've, and they've had an ongoing uh, series of concerns that, that they have addressed to, to the city um, about um, their properties. Um, they've, they've come to the city on several occasions, um, uh, re basically requesting the city or demanding the city uh, purchase their property. Um, this is uh, in, in an area where the, the city, uh, through, through the CRA, um, has already uh, purchased several properties, and, and um, these, these parcels would complete uh, an assemblage of, of CRA city-owned parcels that would be beneficial to the CRA, to the city. Um, and it, uh, even though there was no uh, pending litigation, there was no lawsuit, the, the, the ashrams uh, and the city agreed that uh, it would be beneficial to try to work through what has been ongoing uh, for, for many years now. Um, a, a, a more formal process to discuss uh, the city's purchase of their property and, and, and deal with a lot of the issues that they've been bringing to the, to the city and the city staff for, for, for several years now. And uh, that, that mediation, which is a formal process, it's not a trial, it's not an arbitration, it's, a, it's a basically a formalized settlement conference. You have a professional mediator that kind of does like a Henry Kissinger-like uh, movement back and forth between two different groups and trying to find and forge a, a middle ground, a compromise, but cannot impose a resolution on either side. It's a mediation, it's not where that individual says, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, this is what I find. That's not how it works, it's trying to convince both sides that maybe they aren't um, as right as they think they are and that there is a middle ground that makes sense. And it's, it's a fairly productive, efficient uh, tool for um, the, the settlement of, of, of um, disputes. It's used as a mandatory process um, in the court system. Uh, it's required under the Florida Rules of Store Procedure. Um, so we, w the city uh, met with the, the ashrams on June 20th voluntarily, no litigation, and spent the day with them and worked out a proposal. And that is being submitted to you this evening. Um, it is attached to the resolution, which is your agenda item number 17, and it provides that the city is indeed going to purchase this property. And the amount of the, the purchase price is $1,150,000. Now, there's a lot of different numbers that have, that have come back and forth from the ashrams and counter offers made by the city, and I'm not gonna get into the long history of that. I can tell you that this is an amount that is less than a comparable f figure that would have been used um, based upon the, uh, the value um, of the property that the city did purchase at the corner of Bulldog Drive and State Road 100. So that was one factor in, in, in the, the discussions uh, supporting the, the city's um, offer, which is contained in your settlement agreement. Uh, another factor, and it's not an insign insignificant factor, but this, this proposed settlement agreement includes a release. It includes a release of any and all claims that the ashrams may have or could bring through the, the, it, through the completion of this process of settlement. So, um, and they've, they've raised quite a few uh, through the years. And they were raised, all of them were raised again at the mediation. Uh, the city believes that, uh, we, we feel strongly that while um, these, these, these claims are, are um, without, without merit, uh, that does not mean that they will not be brought. And it does not mean that the expenses associated with defending those claims would not be incurred by the, by the city and by its taxpayers. So that is indeed one arguable benefit of putting all of this behind the city. So with that background, it is ultimately up to the city council to um, review this proposal and uh, um, uh, the, the folks that, that were at that mediation are here tonight and, and other than uh, my partner, Deborah Babnutcher, but uh, um, I'm prepared uh, along with any, like Jim or, or I think, I don't know if Bo's here or not, but he was there, Bo Falgu, and uh, we're prepared to answer any questions you may have. Um, but that's the summary of the process and the mediation agreement um, is attached uh, to the resolution. 
and it provides for the standard terms for the purchase of a private purchase between a private buyer and a private seller, so we do all the due diligence to make sure we're not getting something we don't want, you know, calls for a phase, calls for a phase one and a phase two, and uh, we have a, all the necessary protections for title, make sure we're getting clear title. Um, it does provide for a six month lease back or, or after the purchase, the ashrams will be able to retain possession through a lease for a period of six months at which time um, that uh, uh, lease ends period ends, uh, no, re no renewals, and at that point in time, the city will be able to do with its property what it wishes. Council questions? Questions, Mr. Lewis. <clears throat> is, is there a cost associated with that lease? It is $1 per month. The, the idea behind that is um, to give the Ashrams opportunity to relocate the businesses right. they have there and, and give them plenty of time to find a new home for that business. The transaction for the actual purchase and sale could, could, could go fairly quickly because some of the steps have already taken place in the process of doing the due, cities doing its due diligence. Uh, the ashrams have been in that location for some period of time, and so they requested that they have uh, some, some time after the city purchases the property, if this, if this settlement goes through, to be able to find another property to locate to, locate to and, and then to relocate. And if they can't, what happens? Uh, then they will have to put everything in their garage at home. Uh, they will have to, they, I'm being facetious of course, but th th that, that's their problem. Um, this, this, this is very clear, this settlement agreement is very clear. Uh, the city buys it, they have six months to, to stay there, to, to relocate, and at the end of that, um, they can be f um, ejected. That's the technical term. And have the ashrams agreed to this? They have. They signed an agreement. They have. I have a question about the timing of uh, the, when the city provides the funds and when the ASRAMs vacate. <coughs> Could we go through? I've read the, uh, I'm trying to get the details out of here. It looks like 120 days to provide the settlement. We, the ASRAMs will receive their funds at closing, which is no more than 120 days. They will then have six months from the closing date to relocate. They will have their, they will have all of their monies at closing. I, you know, most real estate that I've ever been involved in, in and this could be a, a, a municipal situation, but when you provide the money, then the, the party who gets the money relinquishes the property. So, I mean, it would take away a lot of the gray area of whether they'll comply with leaving at six months if they didn't have their money already. But if they have their money, they theoretically could play the game later on. If they play the game, there is a legal process called a complaint for ejectment. Um, they, um, the lease would be attached to the complaint and it would provide that it would end at a date certain and that there are no conditions to the term, end of that term, the termination of the term, if you will, um, and the court would enter an, a final judgment for ejectment at which would be enforced by the sheriff. If I, if I may add. Um, Obviously, we're not, we're not planning. I mean, the, it's our understanding that, that since the ASRAMs have signed this and we've received communications from their attorneys that they're out in the process right now looking for a piece of property. So the, I um, um, want, want to stress, the Bulldog Drive improvement project that's going on right now uh, will continue and will be finished, uh, you know. On schedule. On schedule in, in August. Uh, so this doesn't have any impact on, on that whatsoever. Uh, furthermore, uh, we don't have any immediate plans for this property and there will be no cost associated with that those six months to the city. So whether the ASRAMs are there or they're not there, their business there has no financial impact on us. This isn't like you buy a home and you want to move into it, but no, you have to wait until they, they move out. We don't have any plans for, for this property. Um, and, and now, how about the question of the 
source of the funds and how that may affect timing of other uses of that money potentially? The, the um, source of the funds in this case, because this was not an anticipated, uh, eventually it will be the CRA. The CRA does not have the, the adequate funds, so uh, our proposal is that this would be uh, come out of uh, ending fund reserves, you know, those, those um, in, unappropriated fund balance uh, that would be transferred into our capital improvement fund. Th those, as per uh, council policy, our general fund right now is over the 20% maximum that is uh, set up by council policy. Uh, when we are over our, our reserves, then those dollars by policy should either go into disaster reserve fund if it is below our established minimum, which is not the case. It is actually over that minimum, or it goes into a capital fund, so it's a one-time expenditure. It doesn't go into operations. So this will not impact other projects. This will not impact our operation. This isn't going to cause any property taxes or any other tax to go up. Uh, this is um, using the reserve funds that actually were over 20 percent at this point. Is this offer more than we ever offered before? Yes. It is, as Mr. Reichman pointed out, it is um, total cost of the uh, corner lot. It's less than that, but it is more than what we offered. Uh, but it's not this. more than what was asked. No, it's definitely not more than what's asked. It's it's truly the a compromise in between. Other council questions? I guess we'll open the meeting to the public. This is this point. is an agenda item. That's a resolution, Mr. Mayor. So yes, this would be open part of our the process. Public. Anyone in the public wish for her on agenda item number seventeen? Kind of a little out of sequence, but Jack Carroll, Palm Coast. What I understand now is that this property is going to be in limbo for six months. In other words, you won't be able to do a thing with it until they move out or until the six months is up. Suppose we get some kind of an offer that, you know, I mean, we're not going to keep that property forever. I mean, it's not, we're buying it so that we can develop the area to, you know, to a better condition. So if we get some kind of an offer, we have, we have to turn it down because we can't do anything with that property for the, for the next six months. Is that the way I understand it? We'll get an answer to your question. Next speaker. So you don't approach the podium. We'll close the public portion meeting. Come back. Mr. Reichman, uh, my sense is that even if somebody offered me lots and lots of money for the whole thing, it would probably take you six months to... Yeah. To go through the details, but what is what is the, well, the like, specific like, answer? Th th this this was requested. You know, it's I guess the the place I would start is you have to think about what mediation is, and this was something that was part of the request, demand, whatever you want to call it, by the ashrams that during the course of the discussion, this is what they they needed. I can assure you that if the city had an offer that for the, this parcel or, or this parcel combined with some of the other city parcels for a really great amount of money to benefit the city, then it would have made very little interest for this mediation agreement to contain uh, the six-month provision. But I'm unaware of any any uh, uh, developer out there that wants the Ashram property combined with any other parcel that the city owns, you know, to build the Walmart or whatever. So yes, the answer to your Let's question. Not start rumors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, well, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm trying to kill any rumors. Uh, so the bottom line is, is, is that six months in, in, the, in the time frame of development is negligible. For the ashram, six months is, is what they need, what they asked for and what they needed. This is not going to be, from what I've, everything that was discussed but by The bottom line answer to Jack's question is yes. We would not be able to sell it for six months. But correct. But we or could put it, sell it. We couldn't to the close. Lease or we something. could not close on that sale in six months. It doesn't mean we couldn't negotiate and enter into a contract. And the sale for that. To and the lease, is correct. Which is not and, uncommon. And this property is not. I mean, it it has a well and a septic tank. I mean, it it, it 
has a lot of work. You're going to have to go through months of design for any kind of uh, project in the future. Even if we didn't have this six-month clause, uh, we couldn't, you would not see any kind of uh, construction going on here in greater than six months. This does not impact, the six months does not impact this property and the use of this property. Well, plus we would be in ownership of it, which we would allow just, us to negotiate. Sure. Right. We, we could have, that's the whole point, is you, yeah. you know, well, you, you can always have the contract going. The, the bottom line is this brings resolution to a long-standing a uh, series of issues that we've had. Yes. Mr. Ajram wants to run his business. He wants to run his business unfettered. Uh, we want the properties along Bulldog Drive to comply with our codes. This is a resolution, and I, somewhere along the line, I think you said it or the attorney said it, uh, in mediation you wind up with something that nobody's really thrilled with the end result, and that's probably the fairest possible. So. Yes. Back to City Council. Additional questions, comments, or a motion on agenda item number 17? A comment before we move on. Uh, you know, this is a lot of money, and um, but it's we have to find a way to solve this. We have a small business owner that um, with a an, an property that's uh, in non-compliance, uh, a use that's in non-compliance, and looking into the future, it doesn't appear that, that there is a easy way to bring the, the business into compliance. So uh, not an easy decision uh, because of the amount of money. But if, if you think of it in the bigger picture with uh, the other lots that we've acquired and, and the potential, and it's, the potential is going to be, I think, way down the road. But there is potential to do a good redevelopment in that area. Uh, gateway to town center, gateway to city hall, uh, next to a big high school. Difficult decision, but uh, one that has to be made. I have another question. Uh, in my background, I, I uh, have had reason to worry about buying land with not knowing what's underneath it. And given mm -hmm. it being a, a uh, uh, that was in the, in the chemical business. This is not a chemical operation. But suppose we find there's some environmental damage on that property after we buy it. Who's responsible for cleaning up? You have up? a phase one and a phase two, correct? That's correct. We've already had those those uh, environmental uh, evaluations, both phase one and phase two, I believe, have, have been completed. Yeah. If, if, uh, if there, yes. Um, yeah, that and doesn't that's what, mean that's what they look for. Yeah, if there is any, because you have the oil and that type of thing, it's been a Correct. year or so. It's going to be relatively minor, uh, and, and in my opinion, it would be our responsibility. Anything major, you could go back to previous property owners, but because we've had phase one and phase two already completed, we're very confident that we're not going to see find anything major. And, and, and if I just just so you understand, if, if, what you, you have experts that go out to the property. With, the, with knowing, having researched the history of the uses of the property, knowing where the buildings have been, where have the repairs been made, where have the car repairs been done, or whatever, you know, it's never been a dry cleaner, it's never been a gas station or anything like that, but they would know that, so they would know where to look. The first place they look is they look on the surface to see if there's any standing or contaminated soil. That's what a phase one does, and if a phase one shows that, a, that it's a positive, then they, rec then they recommend a phase two, and that's when you start doing soil samples deeper down. So this phase one and phase two have been done, and they've come out showing that this, this does not have uh, a, a degree of contamination that would rise to the level that would cause the city not to want to purchase this property. Now, there are certain properties that you do not want to purchase. You can have an old gas station that had a leak 15 years ago, and there is a plume that's 70 feet deep and 400 yards long, and, and that's something that you don't want to be ever be an owner of. That's not this property. Any further questions? Looking for a motion on agenda item number 17. Move to approve. Second. second. Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries without objection. Mr. Reichman, you said you had several items. I have one more. Uh, and, and this one's going to be shorter, I hope. And, and this is um, on an item that we discussed a little bit not too long ago about uh, a decision that came from the Florida Supreme Court uh, regarding uh, the pre-2010 uh, 
uh, red light camera systems that vary cities, including City of Palm Coast, pre Mark Wendell. And um, there's, a, there's a, a pending lawsuit, it's the, uh, uh, Mr. Mayfield against City of Palm Coast, case number 2009-2245. And um, one, of, one of the uh, very few limitations that lawyers, city lawyers have to speak with their clients, and that's the five of you, um, about um, matters uh, that they need to be blunt and uh, with their, their clients outside of the sunshine is, is uh, involving uh, litigation. It's called an executive session, and I've requested that several times before regarding other lawsuits, and I'm asking, in fact, one regarding this one uh, several years ago. And I'm asking again because um, there are several matters that I do need to dis um, discuss with you regarding settlement negotiations or strat it's a strategy issues related to litigation expenditures, which is allowed under Chapter 286 of the Florida Statutes. And so um, at this public meeting, I am requesting an executive session to be able to, to meet with you in an attorney-client session. Um, and we are, um, with your um, indulgence, we will uh, be conducting this, um, uh, beginning it at an open open session during next Tuesday's workshop, conducting it, and then closing it and uh, reconvening the workshop, um, just like we always do. This will be noticed and um, it'll be transcribed, just like these sessions always are. And when the litigation is completed, that transcript will be typed up and, and it will be made part of the public record. But this will allow your lawyers to speak with you about the status um, of this lawsuit and where we believe it's going to go from here, uh, the defenses that are available, but primarily or exclusively regarding settlement negotiations and, um, and uh, discussing strategy regarding litigation expenses, which is uh, contemplated by the, the statute. So with your indulgence, we will be noticing that in the newspaper um, and, excuse me, at city offices. City office. I beg your pardon. And uh, we will be uh, having this next Tuesday. And that's it. Mr. Landon, I assume you're having a relatively short workshop agenda. Uh, okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> or? Or, yes. I can't. I, Mr. Ma Reichman, anything further? That's it. That's Discussion it. by city thank, manager thank matters not much. on the agenda. Yeah, I, um, first of all, um, staying with serious uh, nature of uh, follow-up with the attorney is uh, we do have our first tropical storm out on the, off the shore of uh, Florida, uh, tropical storm Arthur, um, and it's just a, a good reminder that it is that time of the year. Uh, we've been fortunate, obviously, so far this year, and this storm uh, appears that it's going to stay out and see. It's about 100 miles out right now. Uh, and go on up north and, and once again bypass us. But uh, we are monitoring it, uh, city, county, uh, everybody, we're, we're holding um, uh, uh, briefings twice, two, three times a day uh, with state officials also to make sure everybody's prepared. So, but it's just a good reminder, everybody does need to be prepared. We have uh, a lot of information on our website. The county emergency management has a lot of information as to how to, how to, how to get prepared. On a more fun note, um, you know, it's uh, last, uh, I think it was last meeting, last couple of meetings, I uh, announced that uh, we were having a, a new type of tournament, the National Collegiate uh, uh, Championship for Women's Rugby. Uh, and, and I announced I'd never heard of that before. Well, I have a new one I've never heard of before because I'm not a Pot uh, Harry Potter fan, but uh, uh, the uh, United States Quidditch Association uh, announced today that they are coming to Palm Coast for the Southern Regional Tournament uh, uh, in 2015. So Quidditch is a, um, seems to be a, one of those up and coming uh, uh, sports, field sports kind of uh, um, tournament uh, that's very popular at the college level. So we will have uh, college students, or any age I guess, but I've been told most of them are gonna be college students from all of uh, the Southern United States coming, coming in and playing Quidditch here. This is one of those where we had to compete. It was in coordination with uh, TDC, Tourist Development Council. Uh, they actually took the lead, but um, once again, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you see the poster on the back, uh, we put that out on our fields to say welcome. Uh, out of 35 uh, communities that competed, uh, we won. And this will bring in hundreds and thousands, excuse me, thousands of visitors and, and uh, all part of our 
Prosperity 2021, I think sometimes we forget about how this is really part of our economic development strategy that brings those outside dollars in, helps our small local businesses, and, and is part of our economic engine here and been very successful. So, uh, Mayor, with that quit each story, if you go, go, if anybody wants to look at it, I, I know it's, I, I can't make these things up, but uh, I think it's pretty exciting. We're all, we're all smiles right now. It's, it took a team effort to make it happen, and it's a good thing. So with that, that's all I have tonight. Are we going to get city council brooms or yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, you know I, I bet we could arrange something for it when they come into town we could uh, if you council gets PVC pipes PV yeah. <laughs> that's, whatever that's, yeah. part of the, that's the, about the extent of my quidditch knowledge as well though you, you need a broom <laughs> yes oh and about and those little <laughs> wing balls that flies around yes and don't forget uh uh, 4th of July coming up, uh, we have on the 3rd, uh, the evening of the 3rd is our fireworks at Central Park, and then uh, the morning, uh, Saturday morning, the, no, Friday morning, uh, the 4th is when we have our little uh, brief ceremony uh, out at Heroes Park, and then of course that, that whole weekend, and particularly Friday night. Friday evening uh, you have the fireworks at, at, uh, at uh, Flagler Beach, Flagler and Beach. All, the, all the happening out there, the big party out on Flagler Beach. So. Hopefully, and, and we've been told, you never can tell about these, that Arthur will be far enough up the, the coast that uh, it will not put a damper on our 4th of July festivities. Mayor, that's all I have. Mr. Vice Mayor. I move we adjourn. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.